<clears throat> Good evening and welcome to the June 11th regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. As a point of order, I would ask that everybody turned off their cell phones. Many times they interfere with our RF feed. Um, at this point in time, I'd like you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First order of business, Secretary McFarland, could you please take attendance? Yes. President Singer. Here. Vice President Branset. Here. Treasurer Frizee. Absent. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Friedel. Here. We have six out of seven members present. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Moving into uh, item two, consent agenda. We have items 2.1, which is approval of the minutes for May 21st. We have the following persons recommended for employment, and you can see five of those persons listed on your agenda. Item 2.3, teachers attending tenure, uh, attaining tenure status. Item 2.4, uh, the following teachers, um, tenure teachers have requested a leave of absence. Item 2.5, we have staff members that have announced their resignation effective um, we have May and June of 2018. School systems bills and item 2.7, we have legal invoices for payment. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Support. Moved by Mary, support by Angela. And We'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. Now I'll turn it over to Mr. Shero for a few very important awards. So our shining stars of the month, our first one is Gayla Lively. If Gayla would come up and join me here. And while she's coming up, let me read a little bit about Gayla. Gayla joined the MPS Administration Center team last summer. She came to us from Central Michigan University. Gail is administrative assistant to the uh, Human Resources Department, and we are sad to say Gayla and her husband are moving out of the area, and she'll be leaving us next month. Yeah. Gayla was nominated for a Shining Star by two MPS staff members. Among their comments were the following. Gayla is extremely hardworking and dedicated staff member to the HR department in the district. Gayla is helpful, friendly, and calm when handling high-stress situations. She's always willing to get the job done. From the first interaction I had with Gayla, I knew she was a delightful addition to the MPS team. Her cheerful disposition is always welcoming, even when she is extremely busy. Gayla goes above and beyond to help them when I call her questions, call with her with questions, or when I need help. She never makes me feel like I am putting her out. She demonstrates true concern for issues we may have in our department and strives to help to be helpful and provide exemplary customer service. Gayla sets a fine example of how we should treat all of all employees in our district. I love the concept of Shining Star Award because someone who puts so much of their heart and soul into the job deserves to know how much they are appreciated. And Gayla is certainly appreciated by <coughs> our department. Congratulations, Thank Gayla. And board members, you recall about oh, a couple months ago, I wrote you on a Friday night as I was trying to walk out of here about 6 o'clock in the evening about some of the employees who are still here. Gayla was one of those employees <laughs> that triggered that message. So you, you can see how dedicated she is. Um, our second shining star tonight is Mark Jungle. Mark would come up and join me. bit about Mark um, as well. Mark began his MPS career in 1989 as a math teacher at Jefferson Middle School. His entire MPS career has been spent teaching math to the Jefferson Huskies. In addition to teaching, Mark has spent many years as a basketball coach at Jefferson. He earned his Bachelor's of Science degree from Central Michigan University in 1987 and his Master of Arts degree from CMU in 1992. 
Mark was nominated for a Shining Star by an MPS parent. Among her comments were the following. Mr. Jungle's ability to touch my child and our family is like no other experience. As a family, we have been part of two different school systems, and we have never experienced a teacher like him. When I asked our daughter what she will miss most about Jefferson, her immediate response was Mr. Jungle. <laughs> he goes above and beyond in his incredible attention to wanting the best for his students and players. As a parent, I never received answers that made me feel it was a crafted answer. He gives it to you real. Even if, even if it might not be what you want to hear. <laughs> in every message or conversation we've had, had, it is always as if he was giving the same advice he would use on his own child. He's compassionate and patient, recently signed up our daughter for his math camp. As a parent, not in a million years would I have expected her to ask for this. <laughs> of course, I asked her why, her why she did, and her response was, Mr. Jungle, Mr. Jungle teaches it. Who wouldn't want to go? <laughs> it's not a question that he touches his students and players. He doesn't give up and makes them, um, excuse me, he doesn't give up and makes them work to be successful. He is by far an absolute shining star and deserves to be recognized for this award. Congratulations. <laughs> Great. Now we'll move into <clears throat> item 3.2 for information. We have the IBPYP exhibition re review, uh, and I believe we have Adams and Woodcrest here. Yep. Uh, Linda Lipson and Jeff Penix will start you off tonight. I guess I'll start it off. I'm Linda Lipset, principal at Adams. Um, in thinking about what we wanted to share this evening, Jeff Penix and I spent some time just reflecting upon all the events and special activities that we do throughout the year um, that we've enjoyed in our buildings. A highlight, not only in our buildings, but in all of the elementaries in, in Midland is the fifth grade PYP exhibition. This took place last week with fifth graders at both Adams and Woodcrest sharing with their fellow students, the staff, the communities in their buildings, um, their exhibition projects. Tonight we wanted to share a bit about this. The PYP exhibition is a culminate, cum, culminating learning experience for fifth grade students that requires them to show the knowledge and skills that they've developed during their PYP experience over their elementary years. Exhibition is unique as students pursue topics they're passionate and excited about. As they relate the topics to a central idea, at Adams, the central idea this year was actions can make a difference in conflict and resolution. <laughs> During this process, students form collaborative groups based on their interests and research information that is relevant in the world and important to them. Some examples of topics selected this year include food insecurities, emotional stress in kids, gender equality, and technology addiction. Our fifth grade teachers create a wonderful environment for students in all of our schools as, they, as students research their topics and our volunteer mentors are key in this process. <clears throat> I would like to share a video that gives a recap to that process. Marianne Lepofsky created this um, from pictures collected during the students' work at Adams this year. We shared it at exhibition last week, and it provides a good visual overview. And then Jeff Penix, principal at Woodcrest, and some of his students and staff will share a bit more about their role and their experience and the role of the PYP mentor.
Could be thinking that tune for a while. Right. <laughs> um, but one thing I did want to highlight before I turn it over to Jeff to have the students share their voices about this is that last piece where it had that reflection <clears throat> tree. That was an opportunity for people that went through the building to listen to students and share about their research and their learnings, give some really positive feedback about how, what they learned and how that impacted um, their thinking about some things maybe differently than before they listened to all of the hard work of their students. You also noticed in every picture, in almost every picture, it had an important adult that was working with those teams. Um, they did not uh, lead those teams. They helped facilitate it and ask questions, but really it's up to the kids to do that work. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Penix to share um, with his students more details about that great process. Well, good evening. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, I'm sure you've heard about the exhibition. Ex uh, excuse me, exhibition the last couple of years. <clears throat> and when Linda and I were collaborating on this, we thought once again to reiterate what she uh, shared. We thought it would be wise to point out the unique role that the mentors play, uh, because <clears throat> the mentors really um, are a nice cross section of our community, and they play a very, very valuable role in guiding the students. <clears throat> As Linda mentioned. The first step of the exhibition is the students are uh, working in collaborative teams, and there's tons of learning that come out of those collaborative teams, as we know, uh, for, as professionals and as adults. The first thing they have to do is they have to determine a stance um, on the issue, and I think one, it's one of the key things to point out <coughs> excuse me, is that it's different than the research projects that we would have remembered, because whether we research Saturn uh, or Wilt Chamberlain or something like that, <clears throat> they have to develop a stance on a particular issue. That's <clears throat> easier said than done, especially when um, there's more than one person involved. <laughs> so after um, they've done that, they have to, of course, then delegate duties, real life uh, skills as we know, who will do what. Uh, <clears throat> then they have to uh, collectively determine what to do with the research that they collect. Uh, now, once again, you know, back in our days when we were probably combing through a real encyclopedia where everything was <coughs> organized uh, kind of in a chronological fashion, they are gathering resources from all over the place. And in some instances, like our group that will, uh, of students that we'll have coming up tonight, um, they actually interviewed uh, some folks uh, on a weekend. Um, now that they have the research collected, they have to digest the research. How does it actually relate to the stance? And then, of course, um, they need to determine what is worthy of presenting and how they would present it. So it's a daunting task, and it's a great culminating um, experience as far as the PYP is concerned at the elementary level. And what's really, really interesting about the whole process is that it's student-led for the most part. They determine their stance, they determine how they want to research, they determine how they want to present, but the nice part of that is they have a very faithful guide, if you will, <clears throat> in the mentor. Um, I have two uh, mentors with us uh, this evening. We've got Greg Smith and Aaron Lauterbach. Uh, fortunately for us, they've served as mentors for the last two years, and uh, they've done a great job. In just a moment, we'll have them come up and share their um, experiences as a mentor. Um, 
it's challenging to find mentors in the sense that with the small groups that we use, like at, at Woodcrest and, and the rest of the schools would be similar, but we needed approximately 30 mentors mm-hmm. um, this year. And with the cross-section of the community, as I mentioned, um, we have involved this year retired MPS teachers. We have grandparents, parents of former students, parents of current students in other grades at Woodcrest. And what we've tried to do at our place is so far we've um, used, parents have not mentored their own children. And that we believe right now, at least for us, that may evolve over time, but at least right now we think that has been uh, beneficial. And to our parents' credit who have stepped up, they've been very willing um, to mentor another group in another classroom. And as I mentioned, parents of current students in other grades, for example, we had a, a, a parent who served as a mentor this year who actually had a first, has a first grader and a third grader. No connection to fifth grade, but she was very willing to do it for us, and, and she did a fantastic job. Uh, we also have uh, substitute teachers. To our uh, substitute teachers' credit, we know in how de- high demand they are, and they have found time to, uh, to help us out with that. Um, and other members of our community. So like I said, it's, a, it's a very much a, a cross-section um, our, of our community. Um, the exhibition, I don't think the least what we've uh, seen, we could really do it without the mentors to get the same horsepower out of the project that we currently are getting. The mentors play a very key role in that. Um, as I mentioned, this evening I thought it would be helpful to actually have a couple of people who have served as mentors share their experiences then I also thought it would be helpful to hear from a small group of students regarding their expen- uh, experiences with mentors. The students, um, in our instance, have surveyed and checked in with many other um, uh, students in fifth grade and are kind of speaking on their behalf, not only uh, for themselves. So with that, we'll turn it over briefly to Greg, and then we'll ask Aaron to come up, and then, of course, we'll finish with our students. Thank you, Mr. Penix, and thank you for having me aboard. Uh, my name is Greg Smith. Um, I don't have any children <coughs> in the Midland Public Schools because they're much too old for that. Uh, and uh, but I'm too young to have any grandparents in the school or grandchildren in the school as well. So my connection is my wife Dawn is a para at Woodcrest, and I was invited last year by Mrs. Guston, who teaches fifth grade. Uh, soon to be fourth, as I understand, um, to uh, serve as a mentor. And I did that and enjoyed it very much. And so I agreed uh, really without much uh, arm twisting to do it again this year. Um, So last year, uh, our group was uh, more history-based. I had expressed an interest in in a group that was doing a history project. They were doing what they called the Fall of Cultures, And um, so the idea was, why do certain cultures fail? They succeed for a certain period of time, and then they fail. And I thought it was a great uh, topic. The problem was it was a little bit broad. Uh, They had not limited at all in terms of time or space. After my second meeting, they approached me excitedly and said they had agreed to limit it to the last 1,500 years. (laughs) (laughs) Which eliminated Greece and I think Rome, but I'm not quite sure. Um, So this year, uh, we did a project on how animals are maintained in captivity, basically zoos. And this was an interesting topic because the the children came in with one set of ideas. And I think um, as a result of their research and interviewing zookeepers and um, doing analysis, that some of those views shifted over time. So it was interesting to watch, for instance, one student who was showing me videos from PETA the first day and saying, oh, you know, it's terrible to ever, you know, even, you know, put a dog on a leash or put it, put any kind of animal in a zoo. Um, and I said, well, I said, that's their view. It may be your view, but let's see what some other views are. So I encouraged them to um, access other websites. And PETA was very much part of the presentation, but so were a lot of other um, organizations. Uh, In the end, what we decided to do is an action plan. Um, As the students had decided that not all zoos are necessarily bad, that we would research where the good zoos are. And we found that there's an organization called the Association of Zoos and Aquariums that gives accreditation to zoos that meet some very rigid standards in terms of the way they maintain their animals. 
and they publish a list. And we handed that list out to the attendees at the exhibition and said, here you go, here's some zoos that treat their animals well. And if you're planning a vacation this summer, or, or any time really, consult this list and see if the Grand Rapids Zoo or the Saginaw Zoo is on. They are. I wouldn't mention them by name if they were. Um, the, most, of the, most of the zoos that you're familiar with are on there, but some are not. And it's just a good check. I put one in my own glove box because I like to go to <clears> zoos. And I want to make sure, you know, um, that the zoos are treating their animals well. So that was our project for this year. Um, I would have to say that there was a lot of growth among the students throughout the process. Uh, but I think there was a lot of growth for me personally, too, uh, both last year and this year. Um, I think one of the dangers in our society today is that we become siloed and, and we spend our time with our peers and we don't get to experience the joy and the satisfaction of intergenerational experiences. Now, for me, church is one place where that happens. But for some people, they don't, they don't experience it at all. And none of us experience it as much as we should. So for me to be able to go out of a job where I'm working with people, most of them a little younger than me, but mostly genera generationally equivalent, to go to a, a school setting and, and just to be among children was such a joy. And um, I happen to be a parent of, of four children, and so I know what that's about, but it, it's been a while. <laughs> and so it was great to see their enthusiasm and you can't come out of that without feeling a sense of hope for the future. And, and there's so many negative headlines today. Um, but when you get down to the actual people that are going to be creating our future and you, and you interact with them one-on-one -on -one and you talk with them and you share with them, you come out feeling a lot better about our future. So that's my main takeaway. I think the mentors benefit way, way more than the children. So that's my uh, spiel, and I would say that uh, whoever is teaching fifth grade next year, feel free to call me. I would be happy to come back. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, thank you, Greg, and thanks for, for doing it for two years in a row. Um, next, we'll call up um, Aaron Lauterbach. Aaron, similar to Greg, Aaron has done it for the last two years, and one of the key things um, that Greg pointed out is that uh, with starting out with uh, the history basically of all time and helping them narrow it down to the last 1,500 years, and then, of course, from there, what's really, really interesting is it's done with the PYP philosophy of inquiry and facilitation. So we uh, have met, you might say, for a training sounds a little too formal, but to remind folks that this is a very different approach than how we were taught when people were told facts and basically asked to spit those facts back, that now we're trying to promote facilitation via questioning. And so uh, I'm sure as um, Greg and Aaron helped their groups that they helped but via questioning. Um, and it really, really is fascinating just to help uh, have their help in, in helping the kids make those connections. So with that, we will hear Aaron's perspective. Hi there. Um, I have two children in Midland Public Schools. Uh, my oldest son is a sophomore at Dow High. My youngest son is um, a seventh grader at Jefferson. Uh, both attended Woodcrest uh, for their elementary career and um, uh, both suffered with food allergies um, in elementary. Um, and both had Stacy Hill as their fifth grade teacher, which is kind of how I got drawn into serving as a PYP mentor. Um, last spring, Stacy called and said, hey, uh, I have a group that is really wanting to delve into the issue of food allergies. Um, could you come in and serve? And I, and I said, sure, with, with my experience with my own kids, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I came and met with uh, the group of girls uh, who were interested in this topic, and I was shocked because they had a ton of prior knowledge. Uh, two of the three girls had very significant, very severe food allergies, and they knew a ton. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so their line of inquiry wasn't um, the typical, let's find out about food allergies. They knew a ton. Um, instead, their line of inquiry really followed um, how our kids kept safe at school. 
um, what are the processes and procedures and policies that are in place at Woodcrest to make sure that kids with food allergies are safe? Um, and so after a lot of questioning and a lot of thinking, um, we reached out to Chartwells and the girls sat down and did an interview uh, with staff at Chartwells and really kind of grilled them about <laughs> how, how are kids safe at breakfast and lunch. Um, they also grilled Mr. Penix um, about, you know, the other areas of the building and what the processes and procedures were and could there be things that they could, you know, help tweak in terms of policies, which was really powerful for them. Um, additionally, they were really passionate about educating others, um, in particular other kids. Um, they were passionate about wanting their voices heard about what it's like to be a kid with food allergies, about what it's like... Um, to make sure that kids are sensitive to those with food allergies and to make sure that kids are inclusive of kids with food allergies. And so they developed a program and they had uh, little brochures and they visited other classrooms at Woodcrest to really talk about here, here are our experiences and this is what you need to do huh. to make sure that everyone you know, feels safe here at Woodcrest. Um, it was so much fun to be a part of that process. Um, and so, this past spring, Stacy called again, and she said, you're not going to believe this, but there's another group who really wants to dig into food allergies. You know, are you in for a second year? And I said, of course. And in my head, um, I kind of thought as I hung up the phone, I know where this is going. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be like last year, you know, so I, I kind of dug out some of the resources I shared with the girls last year. And when I went in and met with the group, it was a group of guys None of them had food allergies. They didn't have the prior knowledge that the girls did. And so their line of inquiry, their set of questions, their needs were different in this project. Um, they really dug into what's it like to be a person with food allergies. Um, and they, they didn't know because they didn't have that experience themselves. So ultimately, um, I connected them with my seventh grade son. Um, it was so much fun. I brought Alex back to Woodcrest, so we got to see the new building and, and um, visit uh, after a couple of years uh, being out of Woodcrest. And um, the boys were really serious. They had a, you know, a list of questions, and they had a really rich conversation with my son, um, asking him questions. What was it like? How does it feel? Um, and it was just really a lot of fun to, to watch that. And it was fun to watch my son kind of step up to the plate and, and share knowledge about his experiences. That was really powerful for him, too. Um, so not only did, they, did their line of questions go that direction, their line of questions w w revolved more about the biology of food allergies. Um, what does the role of histamine play? Why does your body react the way it does to certain foods? How, how are food allergies treated? So ultimately, their project looked very different from the girls' projects. Um, and as Greg said, I feel like I learned way more than, than either group that I worked with, just in terms of I, shame on me for going in with very preconceived notions the second year. Um, recognizing that kids um, come at things and come at their learning with a set of experiences that are different, um, which makes them look at things differently, which makes them ask questions differently, which makes them want to take action and be passionate in different ways. So um, I really feel like I was the one that benefited the most, and, and I certainly hope that Woodcrest will act, ask me back in the future because uh, mentoring was, was super fun for me. So thank you for Very good. letting me come tonight. Well, thanks, Aaron. And as you know, you just heard from two of our mentors. So students, come on up. We've got McKenna, Sophie, Addie, and Calvin. And uh, they are from Mrs. Gustin's room. And she looks like she's going to be getting their um, research uh, and project here displayed for you briefly. And then who's going to lead us off, guys? OK, it looks like Calvin's going to lead us off. And once again, they're going to you will hear from their perspective and their uh, classmates' perspective, the role of the mentors. So um, you kind of, sometimes the mentors will help with some presentation. When I was um, asking some groups about what their mentors did for them, they, a lot of them said that the mentor helped put together the poster board and helped with the organization, like, draw to the facts, not the colors, and the, hmm. like, instead of, like, putting a bunch of pictures, put more information than pictures. 
And then I also asked um, some questions about how the mentors um, helped in some ways of experience. And it, they, some classmates told me that their mentors helped because they have more experience with these big projects and they could give pointers on what, where to put things and how to um, research them in what order. And um, I had asked some groups in our class, um, how did their mentor help them with resources, resources for their project in um, poster board in this case? Uh, they had said that their mentor had helped them, um, I mean, uh, they had gotten interviews set up, and uh, they had um, also told me a little bit of, about their action, where they had their, like, their mentor help set up the interview um, for them, uh, like our um, an animals group in our class. Uh, uh, our, their mentor helped them set up their interview, and um, they also helped them um, with, I mean, helping with their poster board as well as helping them with their action and for their for their action. Um, it's basically where you can like take action in a way where uh, you can inform other people about it with um, a cancer pr uh, prevention group. Their mentor helped them bake cookies uh, so they could share them with and, pe and inform, inform people about the um, illness and help them uh, be aware of it and how to prevent it happening to you. And with the resources, they like if they needed to contact someone for an interview, the mentor could help them if they couldn't, because like we couldn't really get in touch with them. But we could email um, some of our interviews because we know them and maybe like one of our parents are friends with them. <laughs> and, um, and our mentor and other mentors, they, when one mentor, they had more background from some, um, some of their problem, like um, water pollution. Their mentor had background about, like, because they worked at Dow Chemical. <laughs> <laughs> and so just having a mentor is really fun because you can have someone to talk to and someone to share your ideas with and have them give you some information that will help you throughout your project. And um, just about how you can get all your facts and some of them they can just give you some information because they've had experience with it before and um, just someone that can help you and sometimes our mentor kind of kept us on topic because <laughs> sometimes we would just float off into a different conversation <laughs> that didn't go along with our topics and so he would just get us back to working hard <laughs> and so yeah, it was a really fun experience doing exhibition and it was really helpful to have a mentor. Thank you. Excellent job, students. Um, I don't know about you, I would have had a hard enough time standing in front of my classmates, let alone at a board meeting. So the kids did an excellent job. Um, in their instance, once again, go back to Greg's point about the intergenerational, their mentor was actually a high school junior from, uh, from Dow High. Oh, and wow. also to give credit where credit's due, uh, I guess Linda might consider her son perhaps a traitor because he was a mentor at, at our <laughs> school, uh, and he's a senior. But once again, that cross-section of the community. So anyhow, we just wanted to kind of give you an overview about the role of the mentor, and I don't know if there are any questions, but Absolutely. we could make appreciate the opportunity for coming forward. So, yeah, well, I had a comment and a question. So first comment was I did notice in the Adams one, too, that there were some college students who obviously were back home. And so that kind of leads into my second question. What is the time commitment? Like, when do they start and when do they end as far as the 
you know, portion of the year and then on a weekly basis, what's the time commitment? So if other people are hearing this and want to participate. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. Hopefully folks who would catch this would consider it. Um, it's really about a six to eight week commitment. Uh, for both of us, we went with the spring time frame. As Linda mentioned, we had our um, exhibition last week. Um, and I would say, generally speaking, they're meeting about once a week. As things get closer, uh, it might be twice a week. But I would think probably on an average, it was probably 10 or so um, meetings. Great. Any other questions or comments? I just Lynn? comment. Um, Thank you, students, and I had the privilege to be a mentor twice this year, once at Plymouth and once at Seabird, and I would like to thank you, mentors, because I know it is, it is a big commitment, but it is so well worth it. I would echo everything you said, and for anybody that's out there, um, I would highly recommend. It's very organized, and it's just a lot of fun, and I learn more things about space and um, energy and <laughs> planets outside our solar system that I ever thought was possible. And then my other group uh, had exercise and dance, and they knew exactly what kind of dance they wanted to do uh, when I got there. So I am so impressed with all you students and what you want to do and, and the information that you research. And uh, you're, you're well-behaved and focused. And for me, I guess from the board member perspective, when we talked about this several years ago and implementing this program, for me personally, it was really exciting to see it come full circle and then attend the exhibitions that I could. And your presentations, the life skills that you've learned with talking in front of strangers and putting all this project together. As Mr. Pennock said, we didn't do those kind of projects <laughs> when we were little. We basically did research, put it in a little notebook and Gave, turned it in. We didn't have to do a lot what you did. So thank you for all your hard work and thank you mentors because uh, it is a great experience. I also had an opportunity to be a mentor this year at Central Park and uh, they had their exhibition last week as well and I was just amazed at the quality of work from these fifth grade students. So hands off, hats off to you guys. Um, my kids worked on um, nanotechnology <laughs> which they had no idea when they started what exactly they were in for. But um, <laughs> it was a learning process for all of us. Um, but I was impressed with the scope of all the kids' work and how well they did in presenting and sharing the duties. It, it was uh, really, really worthwhile. So if you do get a chance to be a mentor, or even if you just see um, the opportunity to go and visit one of these um, exhibition shows, it's just it's a wonderful opportunity to like highlight what our future is all about. Thank you, Mary. Any other comments or questions? Oh. I have a, a comment then. Um, I'm thoroughly impressed. I know this takes so much energy for an elementary school to put on something like this and to organize. And to, to start this off with Mr. Penix and Dr. Lipset getting to, together and modeling how collaborative efforts work, and then the, the teachers and the students working on that collaborative effort as well, and all the questions and concerns and um, conflict and resolution that I'm sure came up during that process, but so many learning experiences and Greg and Aaron, I could hardly, I'm sorry for not clapping after you guys left because I have such respect for the mentors and what they do in the classroom and how important you are to this process. So we're very grateful for you dedicating your time. And students, hats off. What a great opportunity and projects and really putting your whole heart into it and then coming to a board meeting and speaking professionally, I was thoroughly impressed. So very nice job. Thank you for coming. For the opportunity. Thank you. Boy, we talked so long that uh, I had to reboot here. I can take it. Okay. 
So for item 3.3, we're asking for consideration for the approval of the Michigan Federation of Paraprofessionals contract. If you recall, last board meeting, we went in closed session and gave you the details of that. Um, since then, they have ratified their contract, so we can talk a little more openly now before we ask for your approval. Um, um, basically, the salary range is about a 1%. There are um, a few employees in the group that are getting as large as one5 and that's because we... Um, we're asking for two categories of paraprofessionals, and some some will change positions or will will fit into those categories. One category is supervision, and the other one is instruction and office uh, media technology. And so um, we have that contract in front of you for approval. It will take them to uh, 2022. Am I saying that right, Mr. Cooper? Correct me if I'm wrong on that. 2020. Excuse me. 2020, and so there are there are one negotiated group that's in a little bit different cycle, and so there we are ready to ask you for approval for that tonight. Great, I would accept a motion for item 3.3. All right, I move for um, approval of the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals contract. Or is there one that I'm supposed to read on here? Nope. All right. Support. Moved by Angela. Support by Scott. And I'll open it up for discussion. Is there any discussion or comments? I think we heard yeah. a lot of the, de I mean, we heard all the details at our last meeting when we went into closed session. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, we will move it into a vote then. Um, all in favor of item 3.3, consideration of Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals contract ratification, please say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 3.4 for action, which is the Regional Enhancement Millage Renewal Resolution Adoption for November election. And Mr. Sherrill? So as you know, we have this for an August election. And so um, as a county, we plan on passing that or renewing that in August. But if there, we were to not, we wanted to have a backup plan before we would lose the collection of that almost $4.8 million dollars. Um, uh, for our county schools, so we are asking you to pass a resolution that this could go on the November ballot if that was to happen. Very good. I'd accept a motion for item 3.4. I move that the Board of Education adopt the Regional Enhancement Millage Renewal Resolution for the November election should the millage not pass in the August election. A complete copy of the resolution will be attached to the minutes. Support. Moved by Mary, support by Angela. And is there any discussion? Hopefully it's passed the first time we're out. Right. Uh, well, right. and to say, I think this is the third renewal of this. Correct. For the third time. Third I mean, time. We, the, the first time we passed it, and then it was renewed once, and this is it's a renewal. It's, it's not, not an increase. Right. It's right. not an increase. A renewal, and we appreciate the uh, folks going out to the ballots in August so we don't have to come back in November. Mm -hmm. So all in favor of item 3.4, Regional Enhancement Millage Renewal Resolution Adoption for November election. Say aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. We'll move into item 3.5 for action, which is the Michigan High School Athletic Association. Mr. Sherrill. So this is a yearly request. Um, Michigan High School Athletic Association is a private organization that um, <coughs> I'm pretty sure about 100% of the school district, public school districts participate in, but to do so, you have to approve each year to join them and that you will follow the rules of the Michigan High School Athletic Association. So a bit of a formality, but renewed each year. Okay, I'd accept a motion. Okay. I move the Board of Education adopt the MHSAA resolution for the two Midland public schools, middle schools and two high schools for the 2018-19 school year. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to these to the original minutes. Thank you. Support. support. Oh. <laughs> Moved by Scott, support by Mary. And is there any discussion? Uh, formality. So uh, we'll go into vote. All in favor of approving the Michigan High School Athletic Association um, agenda item, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 3.6 for action. We have the salary letter for employee groups for 2018 and 19. So a longstanding tradition in the public schools is a, has been to bring salary um, advancements for the next school year 
um, to you each year for approval. In there, there are 14 employee groups. Um, there are uh, several that are um, bargaining units, and there are, um, if I can give you the exact number, I'm thinking 11 of them, I believe, that are not former bargaining units. They have their salary increase in there. Basically, the salary um, that you'll see here is sticking to our typical 1% that we've been sticking to at this point, 1% increase for our employees going forward. There are a few exceptions. I mentioned the one pair section of theirs so that could be up to 1.5. And we do have one other group, um, the skilled uh, workstation support technician, because we have simply fallen so far behind the market conditions, we've been not able to keep them. And so they get a 50 cents increase. So still not, not a large one, but we are trying to make some traction in that category as well. So lots of details in there, um, long, several history documents in there. You can see where employees had given concessions, where some have recovered, where have some have come back. So there's lots of information in that salary letter um, that carries forward. So we are looking for approval for the salary letter for the 18-19 school year. Okay, and I would accept a motion. I move approval of the salary letter for employee groups for 2018-19. Support. Moved by Angela, support by Lynn. Any discussion? You gave us a lot of information there. We went through it, and uh, it was nice to have the history behind as well. And I'm glad that we can um, give the 1% to the teachers and the 1.5 to the pair pros and, and uh, move in a positive direction for uh, technology as well. I think that's important, and, and when we have opportunities to do that, to, to make those moves. Are there any other comments? If none, we'll move into uh, vote. All in favor of item um, 3.6, salary uh, letter for employee groups, 2018-2019. Say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We're moving into item 3.7 for information. Presentation of the 2018-19 general operating budget. Mr. Cooper? Well, good evening. As, as you know, at this time every year, I come to you with the budget for the next year. Uh, I think I'd like to start with just a quick review of your timeline and, and where you're at there. We did our budget workshop back on the 16th of uh, April. Uh, tonight we're here for the proposal or the proposed 1819 budget and then the public hearing to follow directly after. Uh, and then again, we meet twice in June for the board. Uh, you meet again on June 25th. You'll do two actions there. Sometimes it gets confusing, but we will adopt this 1819 budget, and you will approve the final budget amendment, the 1718. And of course, it just starts the cycle then, because then the audit will happen in the summer, and we'll start on and, and move forward. And, and of course, the 1819 budget will also reflect any adjustments we need along the way. I always like to remind people the budgets. Not really advisory in nature. Uh, for a public entity, the state requires we have it in by July 1st. It also requires that we reflect where do we get our resources from, where's the revenue coming from, and how we're spending it. So anytime there's a change along the way, whether uh, we get a grant someplace along the way, we do amendments. And typically, as you know, we do those in March and in June. Uh, and then, of course, the audit is our final say when we get, we get all finished there. All right, well, one of the most important things we have to do at a budget is to set the millage rates. And while the first one's not a surprise, the 18 mills on the non-home, uh, excuse me, on a non-homestead property is uh, what we've been levying for a long time here, uh, and it's what you can levy. The next one, the 1.6814 mills on homestead, that's our hold harmless uh, millage. If you recall, um, set uh, back uh, when Prop A came in, uh, you could raise $415.31 a student. So there's two things that I have to do every year, and that is take, take the current taxable value, have to take the estimate of the number of students we have, and figure out how, much, how many mills we can levy. Every year we can come back and adjust that, um, because of course it's an estimate, both on the taxable value when you're doing this in June or May, and again when you get into the school year, and of course the number of students will be a factor. Uh, the other thing that's been a factor lately is the personal property tax, which is slowly being removed from what's the taxable value, and when that happens, it changes a little bit. This happens to be slightly down from a year ago. Uh, it was at 1.7100. Uh, 
Um, of course, in the city, all these millage rates get split in half because we want you to recall within the city limits, we do two tax levies in the summer and the winter, and in the, in the county, outlying county areas, um, we just do it once a year in the winter. The other thing is our bond uh, millage rate. Uh, if you remember, it started at uh, 2.95, uh, went to 284. Well, this year it's at 272, and it's going to remain at 272. Um, we don't, uh, I'm no expert at that. We have financial advisors that look at where we are. They look at the taxable value and how much it's grown. They, they know where we stand with the bond and the repayment of the bond, and then they determine what that millage rate is that you should issue for that year. So this one happens to be the same. If uh, Looking at the material they sent me, I would just tell you that the taxable value Um, that's not a bad thing um, because, as you know, when that personal property tax comes out, uh, that actually, for a long time, they were predicting it would cause the taxable values to drop. The real property is kind of catching up with it, so it's growing. I think it was 0.35%, though, but that's not, not huge, so um, it's the exact same bond rate. And again, that would be split just like um, anything in the city is. So those are the millage rates that we have in this bond, or in this uh, budget, excuse me. Uh, there's some major assumptions that we have to make all the time, and the first one's with, of course, the part of the formula we don't control, and that's the state aid. Um, we do know they're very close, but uh, like close is like tomorrow is what I heard, which doesn't help us when we're meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so the state aid formula, uh, our major assumptions from the state is it will be a 2x formula. I used 115 per student, uh, which would take us to $8,526 a student. The 115 looks like it will be 120 when the budget finally goes through. That's a small enough amount. When we get to adjustment time, we'll just adjust it. Um, but it looks like it might be $5 more per student when the state finishes with that. Not that the 20M funding rolled in means much to anybody, but once in a while as we go through this, uh, we get so much per pupil, but part of it is sometimes made up out of another fund, this 20M. It, and it's due to a f uh, kind of a complicated formula, but it was where inflation was not going to allow us to get the same uh, increase this past year as other school districts would get. And so they put the extra funding, which had to be $6 a student. Uh, it's only important when they don't leave it in there. Uh, and we've experienced that in the past a couple of times where they've put it in that way and then said, oh, by the way, you don't get to keep that. And so the next year when everyone else is getting the increase, you don't get the same amount because you're not adding it on to the same. So uh, the big difference here is whether they consider us making uh, $8,405 a year per student this year or is at $8,411, and they rolled that in. So that $6 per student stays with us. So it is kind of important. Uh, there's no change in shared time or there are non-public K funding. That could have meant thirty dollars or 40000 but it looks like they're not going to touch that. We do provide some services to our uh, non-public parochial schools, and there was a lot of talk early on that they would not allow us to do kindergarten anymore. Kindergarten's been one of those outside of the public schools where uh, for a long time they wouldn't let us do it, then they let us do it. So it's been one of those going back and forth. The other part of state aid is categorical. That, those are in categories of where they give you funding. Um, last year, if you remember at the start of the year, we really didn't know where we stood on 31A, but by October we knew. Um, we're expecting the same thing. Um, it's 30% of what we'd normally get because we're a hold harmless district. So if, when you see the amount of money, which last year, 500, I think, Brian, five, yeah, just, just a little bit more than 500,000, that's about 30% of what, if we looked at all of it and did the formula, we, we, we would receive if we weren't a hold harmless district, but we expect that to stay. And the other thing that got added late last year, uh, after we had already put a budget in, was the high school uh, per pupil bonus. They added $25 per high school student uh, to the funding mechanism, and that's staying. So we have both those. Uh, other major revenue assumptions on the state aid, and, uh, and again, not to, there are enough numbers that they would scare you here, but these two, the 147s, deal with the retirement. And the state's done a couple different things. Uh, there's a 1 and a 2, 147A1 and 147A2, and then there's a 147C1 and a 147C2. Um, in essence, one of them caps it, so we only have to pay up to a certain amount. The other one is like an assist to us to help pay uh, the parts we have to. And then they added a couple in the last couple years, um, uh, one that uh, helped pay because the rate of return has been changed at the state level. 
and so they needed to pay that off. And the other one, which is no longer there, the 147C was a one-time only, and that had to do with the uh, buyout the state did uh, increased retirement, uh, I think it was three or four years ago now, when the state changed their multiplier. So um, they're still there. It's always important. Doesn't mean a whole lot to anyone else, but it, that was one of the issues until the state stepped in that was causing budgets a lot of problem was the retirement system and the percentage that districts were having to put in. So them capping it, them supplying the money, if those two categoricals ever went away, it would be very noticeable in school districts across the state. So it's important to know there's, there's a lot of money there. They're in and out monies. In other words, they give it to us, and then we pay back to them for the retirement. Um, but it's better than them not giving it to us. Mm -hmm. So just it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, it looks like, though, this latest conference looks like they might add a couple of these back in, but there was no uh, uh, my STEM or the 104D grant or the 35A, which is uh, early literacy, but it looks like they might be funding those to some level. We'll have to add those at amendment time, but it wasn't very clear. The, the three different branches, the Senate, the House, and the Executive, were not in agreement on, on what should happen with those. Of course, we have to make some assumptions on the revenue on our own. And the other big factor is not just the funding per pupil, but it's the enrollment. So, of course, we do use consultants, and the consultants are telling us that um, we should lose approximately 53 students, that we would have a blended count of 7,634. You know, the last couple of years, um, the consultants have been wrong in a good way for us. We've had more students than that. Uh, I really do hope the trend continues. It's not a bad one. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you've been here long enough. You've seen it go the other way, too. This is just their best prediction of, of where we should be. And again, it's, it's the, the birth rates aren't changing very, very much. And they have decreased in the last few years. And that's, that's what you're seeing. But that's where we're at. There were trig grant uh, technology grants in there. And we've basically uh, spent all those, especially when the state was changing to online testing. Mm -hmm. They were providing a lot of money that we were able to use. And of course, that's now done, so we don't have any. Um, the one thing that is nice, um, we have been increasing our interest revenue. It's coming back to what it was a long time ago. But for a long time, the, the return you could get on your money was not very good. So you're seeing, I know what's well, not a whole lot, at least wanted to let you know that you know, it's 65000 more than we, we've been getting in the past. So it, it is growing what you can get on your money as it sits and, and, and waits. Um, and I also had to put in there the passage of the countywide enhancement millage. While this one coming up really would affect the following uh, time, I, I do think it's important to let everybody know that that is an assumption. It's a, it's a pretty good size of money anywhere from uh, three and a half to, to four million as far as Midland is concerned itself. And of course, the other county schools are also not getting that much money because it's done on a per pupil basis kind of thing and, and your percentages, but it is an important part of what we do. So a couple of things just to give you some background on it again with those revenue things. I just wanted to show you the enrollment to give a little history. And of course, I provided that too in the budget narrative so you could see it. But um, basically, I, I've left 2008-9 uh, there because that's the last year we got 20J. So it's kind of interesting to go back to that time. That's when a lot of the financial things started to hit us a little bit. And look at enrollment. Um, again, 1819 is an estimate based on everything we know. I think you'll see special ed stayed uh, somewhat consistent. Secondary has had to take some of that drop that's been coming through the elementary schools for quite a while. I think the one interesting thing is if you look at between 16, 17, and 17, 18, uh, and wondering this year, how did we beat the estimates? Because as you remember, we were supposed to lose about 56 kids. You'll see that um, the elementary enrollment actually went up, uh, which is a little unusual, but I think with opening new schools and doing the new construction, that uh, I'd have you take a look at. So um, enrollment another way, sometimes I think the line graph shows you a little better. Uh, we were on that downward hill for quite a while. You'll see basically it's really between 13 and 14 was the last time we had one of those bigger drops, but it was pretty consistent there. And uh, the big difference is we've been able to stabilize it. If you look at the end of that graph, it's when you stabilize the enrollment, it makes it much easier to budget and predict what's going to happen uh, and follow from there. So that's, that's been a nice trend in the last four to five years. Uh, when you look up our, our per pupil funding, um, again, uh, we'd be looking at 8526 If we get five more dollars, we'd be looking at 8531 I wanted to point out to you back in 8-9, we were getting 8904 So um, this is one of the bigger increases this year that, than we've seen in a long time. 
And that's a good thing. Um, but there's a way to go even to get back to where we were in 8 and 9. Uh, the way this goes, they do look at what your local millage can provide and um, what your local tax base is. And the state makes up the difference after that to get to you per, uh, per pupil funding on that. So um, it does vary from year to year. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've had lately has been that personal property tax. Midland County and where the middle public schools sit, there's quite a bit of personal per, uh, property tax out there. And that's been, as it's been removed and not taxable, um, it's dropped the local share just a little bit. But still, Midland is a heavily locally funded still, even um, by state standards. All right, so we're looking at, a, in this budget, uh, the revenue at 81716910 And like I said earlier, you can really see um, about 66.5% of it's out of the state. A little bit of federal. Uh, that transfers is, includes our uh, enhancement millage. So I just wanted you to know where that came from. Your local property tax and other local revenues, which can be grants and, and other things for the local revenues. You can, you know, uh, revenue from... Uh, um, anything that we charge for, but it also can be uh, local grants like some of the STEM grants we've been receiving. We also have to make some expenditure assumptions on this. We have continued, if you remember, we call it our balance, our budget process. Uh, we've been trying to maintain building departments close to the levels. Uh, you'll see it's gone up. You can't stay at those levels forever. Um, there are some of those things that we do have to spend, so we just try to be diligent about where we let the resources go. Uh, to help us meet what we're doing. There's an approximate 1% salary increase uh, for all employees. Uh, I think Mike said it well in the salary letter. There are a couple places it changes a little bit, but, but it's there. And we do have step increases. People tend to forget that because we did freeze for a while. Step increases are as people get experiences, there are scales that they move on, and that does make a difference uh, in, in where we're headed, so it's important you know that. Uh, the medical premiums, 10%. Um, I know in some cases you might have read then maybe we should go higher, but I'd want you to know that where our medical premium comes due, it's in January. So the 10% is really to help us get through um, half of a year, not a full year. And we do have a 5% in vision. Uh, we're still contributing the same level for the employer share of the HSA contributions. And when we staff, we always try to look at it in terms of do we have replacements we need, reductions, or is there something additional we need? And by watching the staffing numbers closely, that helps us too. Um, working. All right, so what I have here in the chart is just our best right now, remember, is our March estimate. So that first column is just where we stood in March. You've seen all that before. That's just our best estimate in 17, 18, where we are. The new budget is the bolder column, second column in, and it's showing you where we are estimating and where we say the 18, 19 budget will spend its money. Um, as you look down there, you'll see that the total expenditures are going to come to $80,644,747. Um, these are done by different categories here. You'll see salaries, benefits, and so on. I will say there's one thing about the salaries where you would expect them to go up more than you see there. Don't want you to forget in this year's budget uh, was also the year we, as our people came out of concessions, we had uh, the budget surplus protection checks that we issued. That was in the budget. So I would tell you salaries did go up more than 30000 with that. Um, you'd have another, I'm going to guess, 400000 that would have been there, but it was already in the budget, which typically you would not have that amount already contributed to salaries. But that comes from, from where we stood coming out of this one. Benefits, like I said, are up there. Purchase services and contracted services in a budget this side, that's not a lot of differences. You can see on the supplies where it's gone up a little bit. We talked about that. You'll see it's up just a little bit. Um, some of the capital outlay just depends on what we're doing at that time. I'm sure some of that also is down because of things that we're doing with, with bond funds too. Um, leases just depends what we're looking at or gifts. Uh, that category covers a lot, the other. So it could be that our leases are down because we're not doing copiers, but the contributions that we're getting the gifts from outside could be up because we're getting some of the STEM grant. All right, and so again, you see just a slight change on the expenditures from where we currently are. Uh, when we look at the benefits, um, that's the, the big change there is the health insurance. Yeah, it would be that 10% uh, increase. 10%, right. In there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to be a little careful like on HSAs too because the way we fund those, um, uh, 
you get two, two times, but we do allow employees to draw if they've spent the first half of the deductible. So you actually have to budget. So that's more like a little lower than you would expect, even with the 10%, because you do have to budget in case they were to draw or, or, had, the, or had the need to draw early. So, yeah, that would be basically be the increase in the medical cost to the plan. And, again, we won't know that for sure until we get closer to January. So we want to budget a little carefully to, to make sure we can cover it. Could it be higher? Could it be higher? And when we see those leases, like the copy machines, that really helps us. The bond has helped us out tremendously Very much in so. order to yep. um, see these numbers. Uh, so then again, it's the $80,644,747. Um, if you look at it, this one is by account number. So it it's, um, doesn't change much. That 85 to 86% kind of goes to our employees. Again, we are a personnel business, and that's the way it is. And so you'll see salaries, FICA, retirement, medical, other benefits. The other, about 14%, not very big, but it's purchase services, contracted services, supplies, et cetera. Another way to look at those expenditures, uh, same amount, guys. It's just a different way to look. If you want to know where your money goes, you can see, again, I think we've talked about this a few times, try to keep it close to the classroom, student support, instructional support, um, smaller amounts going to maintenance, transportation, administration, et cetera. This is an impressive pie chart. I always like looking at that and seeing how much uh, of our funds are staying in the classroom and yeah. around our students. Um, just the general fund snapshot that I know you like to see. Again, the first column is where we stood in March with our estimate. And again, for our budget, what we're projecting is the 81 million, 81.7. Uh, for budgeted revenues, the 80.6 for budget expenditures. Uh, that looks like we still have excess revenue uh, of about just a million. Um, you'll look down, and we do have a budget variance. We basically have always put that in there as 1%, but, you know, historically that can vary from 2 to 3. Um, it just depends on, as we close out the books for this year, who's spending money where. And while we can have a good idea, this is a big organization, it's almost impossible to pin that down. And I've seen it both ways, but 2 to 3 is more like someplace in there. One keeps you safe so you know where, you, where you've been. So that surplus with the variance, if we get that variance, would be 1.8, almost 1.9. And then the difference there, I want to make sure um, our unrestricted fund balance uh, is looking like 15.7, uh, which is 19.5%. Now, that's the unrestricted part, because remember, it's very often I'm showing you the fund balance, which is going to be much higher. And then there's, uh, there are things in there that have been restricted, and then there have been things in there, like things we've bought already and the money's sitting there. Or there's also um, all the donations that we get. So the STEM grant can't be spent that way. So I like to show you the unrestricted um, because the if you just take the total fund balance, it would be closer to, to 22%. Right. Um, but a lot of that is that STEM grant that's sitting there that we're using for everything that we're doing over the next uh, eight years, 10 years, however long uh, that goes forward. By the way, if you remember too, a lot of our contracts were on the basis of they gave us protection on where our fund balance was. And to get the 1%, it had to be 16. So you're seeing that we're gonna make that, which is good for our employee groups, so that's a good thing. And so that's there. Just a little general fund history. Just because it felt so positive, I had to put something there to remind <laughs> us all how we got here. And that's just part of what I have to do. But, you know, if you go the last few years and you're just looking for where does that revenue bar exceed the expenditures. So for the last four years, looks pretty good. Uh, I want to remind you that if you go back before that, you'll see there was a run of we weren't. That's how you got through this is by keeping a healthy fund balance. It's what got you here. And it got pretty close a couple times in there. Just wouldn't want you to. Uh, ever forget that? I want to be pessimistic, and I, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we're not a bank. We're not trying to save everything, but by the same token, it got you through some tough times. And I think that's always important to to remind you for. And um, I think we're we're working hard to to get a healthy one, and then of course spend it wisely uh, uh, where it makes the most sense. Well, it really shows us how important that enhancement millage is too. Yep. Yeah, because yeah, that loss right away would send you the other way. Um, again, different picture of the same thing. This is an unrestricted um, fund balance. So this, excuse me, this is the um, full fund balance. So it just shows you a little different, but it just shows you again in dollars if you're reading the scale on the um, left-hand side and the percentage that represents. 
Um, and you can see that, you know, when, when you having the most trouble was in this area, we had a couple little runs and a little peak. Uh, along the way here, sometimes it was the federal money that came in that peaked us for a little bit and then back down. But um, you can see we've had a healthy trend back up. Other thing I would also tell you is, of course, that um, we do moving into the next budget year. Uh, we have settled contracts with all the employee groups, but it's also the ending year for many of those employee groups. So the other thing is it's nice to have the fund balance there so you can work forward as you, as you uh, work with those groups. Well, maybe one of the more vital ways to look at a fund balance is how many days you can operate, and we're a little over 60. But remember, we do go 30 some days without a payment from the state. And so anytime you dip below 30, you'd be in the borrowing mode. So Right. The other thing is the fund balance is so important with aging buildings and mm -hmm. the possibility that, you know, a transformer or whatever it was at Dow that went out last year that was such a big ticket item that was totally unexpected. So we have to have that covered. <laughs> And with a, a younger educators and knowing that we're going to continue to grow. This is the lowest your salaries will ever be. So, we, you know, with that change over we've had over the last two or three years, it will only go up. So, Wow. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. It was good to go over this in FFO and get a lot of questions asked as well. And then uh, the, all the slides and detail were in the, the board packet, which we've had for a while, to really look over. So I appreciate all your work and getting that information out to us. Don't do it alone. I always want to tell you that the business office, um, with Lori Holderby and everybody back there, um, they're the ones that do all the all the hard work and uh, pull us through that with uh, just a very few people doing uh, doing a lot of work back there. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> yes. Well, now I believe we go into public hearing yep. for this. And Correct. I had something I had to read, I believe. I'll go ahead and read uh, from the June 11th letter for the operating budget. Sure. Uh, Michigan Public Act 621 of 1978, the Uniform Budget uh, Budgeting Act requires all local governments to adopt balanced budget in a format specified by the state before July 1st of each year. In addition, Public Act 4 of 1995 also requires a local unit of government to hold a public hearing on its proposed budget and state in part that property tax millage rate proposed to be levied to support the proposed budget will be subject of the hearing. The initial portion of the June 11th board meeting has been designated as a public hearing on the PA 621 budget. Do I have anyone that would like to come forward and uh, speak on behalf of the budget? No one? Okay. We will go into item 3.9 for action. We have furniture purchases for Chestnut Hill and Siebert. I guess I'm back on. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we have, as you know, and we're progressing through this kind of a pattern here. As we're doing these schools, we buy the furniture for the cafeteria, and then we progress to the media center, and then we'll progress to the maker spaces. They are a little bit ahead, and I mentioned that in the board write-up on the cafeterias, the addition parts. So as, as furniture takes a while to get here. So what we have here is the furniture, uh, the cafeteria tables in particular, though there are a couple of teacher chairs and desks and file cabinets for the stage areas where the, uh, a lot of the schools have been running their music program, not that that's what they have to do. So they're portable so they can move them. Um, this is Great Lakes Furniture we're recommending, Holland, Michigan. They're using the national sales prices on these. Uh, Chestnut Hill and Siebert are the exact same amount because they're getting the exact same number of tables. Um, they have different lunches, so be, they're not identical in enrollments, but the way they feed their students, it's almost identical what needs to be in there. So it's a total of $42,644. And like I was saying earlier, um, we'd want to try to bring the media furniture to you in July and the maker spaces sometime after that. So we would recommend approval. Great. I'll accept a motion for item 3.9. 
I move we approve item 3.9. Support. Uh, okay, furniture purchase for Chestnut Hill and Siebert. Moved by Scott, supported by Angela, and we'll open it up for discussion. I think it's really important to um, recognize that 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 cafeteria space is cafeteria space. They don't have to clean it all up and get ready for gym. Um, they have separate spaces, and and what a what a great uh, I, help in trying to pla plan staffing and students' time. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's wonderful. Once again, we're doing the same model at all the schools. So by the time we're through, you know, Adams next year, every single school will have this same space with their own cafeteria separate from their gym. So every school will get the same thing. Mm -hmm. Bob, do you know when they renew these, the annual agreements? It, uh, obviously, we have set pricing for... 2018 that we're dealing with right now that are part of these agreements. Do you know when when they renew? If there's if it's an annual, they're going, going to follow calendar. So or? far, it doesn't appear to follow a calendar. I double checked with what we paid. Um, it's about six dollars more um, a table is what it costs. So they're staying reasonably close. It just uh, just changed. It actually. These are a little bit cheaper too because once in a while the um, which is part of the national contract to the install or the shipping can can fluctuate a little bit based on on their national uh, pricing but it doesn't appear necessarily to be I get the feeling it's seasonal but um, it, so far in the process of us doing it this is the first time it's changed I guess I'm just asking if there's anything we should be looking at forward or maybe even quicker if they were to I don't know if Great Lakes would oh, make you, you apprised of any type of real increase that would come about that they were they, they have been pretty good about that and in other words if they can see something that's coming they've been pretty good no, notifying it um, I think we're going to be um, a lot has to do with suppliers and Great Lakes covers a lot of suppliers uh, this is Seco who is where we've been getting the cafeteria tables so um, I think they would let us know if anything's going on I think we have a pretty good relationship with them now, um, especially with all, all the things that can go on with furniture. It's pretty interesting trying to get it all here on time and, you know, the different parts that go into it. But, uh, no, I feel like I have a pretty good relationship, and we've been trying to make sure. Um, I would say to you that, you know, we'll have tables one more time with Adams, and depending on and when that building gets started, we would be looking ahead. Even if we had to store them, I'm kind of along the same lines you are, too, because the hard part to know is, when will they finish the additions? Um, but if, if we're down to only one school we're worried about, that's something you could buy and set aside and not have to worry about storing, you know, three schools worth of cafeteria tables. Mm -hmm. um, the, the media centers and maker spaces take a little bit longer because every media center gives them a... Well, we're putting very similar ones in, and on the tour it was kind of interesting. Mike would it would heard this. They would say, oh, this looks just like the media center at that's kind of cool I didn't know that was going to be that way but they're all slightly different on wall space what you can put where how much permanent shelving those kinds of things tweak it just a little bit and how big their collection is yeah. so I think it is something worth uh, thinking about but I feel pretty comfortable with the two furniture companies we've been working with that uh, they keep me pretty well apprised when there's anything like that Great. I'm glad we can use the national uh, contracts and, and also uh, move on this uh, in time so we can have furniture before school starts. So if, um, if we could move into a vote, all in favor of purchasing uh, furniture for Chestnut Hill and Siebert, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it carries unanimous. Moving into item 3.10 for action, we have storage area network. Mr. Cooper. Do the best I can on this one. Uh, I got Dave Deesick here if you need a lot of details. Um, this is really about our electronic storage, and it is out of date currently. Um, we use a lot of different formats of electronic data, as you can read in there. It's not just the uh, computer, but the phone and the data backup systems. Um, we did put this out the bid. You have that information. The low bidder was Trivalent Group of Midland, Michigan, and their bid was three hundred seventeen thousand five hundred and eight. Um, that is uh, within what we had for the technology for this part. Uh, we did do a little look, look as the note says in your agenda. Um, this is 
in essence, an equipment bid with um, professional services that don't fall under um, the prevailing wages. Basically, the equipment is what we're getting um, with this purchase. And so it really was not affected by uh, the latest ruling like some of the other things will be. If you do have questions, I do have Dave here. But okay. um, I think I tried to put on the bid tab the different categories so you could kind of see what each of them were. There were different components in the system that they looked at. Very good. Thank you. Yep. I'd accept an, a motion for item 3.10. I move to purchase um, the new storage area network. Support. Moved by Angela. Support by Mary. Open for comment or question. Any idea how long this is uh, going to carry us? Bob slash Dave. <laughs> yeah. I think I might ask Dave that one. So the current systems lasted us about six years, and I would anticipate about the same thing, five to six years for this. Okay. Um, it's fairly common for a storage area network to last that long. We run all of our virtual servers and most of the district off of this, so it runs 24-7, 365. So. Any other questions? And do we have all backup protection that we need for this? Yep. Actually, we're going to be doing a third level of protection with this one as well. So uh, right now we have two different places we store our data so that if something happens, we've got backups in two places. We'll be adding a third. Awesome. Well, reliable computer and phone is uh, in all of our data is so vitally important. So we definitely need to keep up to date on technology and um, this looks like a, a good work on, on finding a, a good solution for this. Thank you. Okay, I will move into vote for the storage area network. All in favor of approving the storage area network service, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it carries unanimously. Mm -hmm. Item 3.11 for action, we have the summer tax rate. Mr. Cooper. Yeah, and the city was just calling me today, so... Uh, well, like we do on an annual basis, they're waiting to say how much is the split and what should we put on the summer tax bill, which we will hand deliver it to them tomorrow. Um, if you look at the resolution or have looked at it, I would draw your attention to the point where it really talks about, which is page two, how it's going to be split. So as you would expect, the 18 mills get split nine and nine. Um, we do have to split the hold harmless. Um, and so you're asking for an 8.4. It's not always easy with the hold harmless because of the numbers you saw to split it directly in half. So we do the best we can um, to split that in half. Uh, the uh, commercial personal property is six, so there's three there. And the bond at uh, uh, 2.72, we would split as 1.36. So what this is really doing is just informing the city, here's our millage rates, here's what we want you to put on the summer. Tax. If you remember back in November, you informed the city that you wanted a summer tax collection, the two collections. So this one just is the formality of telling them, here's what should go on the tax bill. Very good. Thank you. I'd accept a motion. All right. I move to approve the resolution certifying the tax rate that is to be levied in the summer of 2018 on the property of the school district within the city of Midland. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. Moved by Angela, support by Mary. And all in favor of uh, approving the summer tax rate? Oh, do we need a roll call for this? Okay. Mr. McFarland, could you do a roll call for us? I can. President Singer? Yes. Vice President Branstad? Yes. Treasurer Frizzi is absent. Member Baker? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Friedel? Yes. And I also vote yes. We have six yes votes. Thank you. Okay, now we move into, uh, looks like item 3.12, which is the superintendent contract renewal. And um, give me a second here. Okay. 
So I wanted to give you a little background on Mr. Shero and uh, the contract uh, that we're looking to propose today. Mr. Shero in November of 2017 had an evaluation and we rated him highly effective in all categories. Since Mr. Shero joined MPS, his salary has changed by 1%. Um, his current salary is $162,610. Mike's peer group that we benchmark against is our superintendents in Michigan. Mike's wages and total compensation is at the lower end compared to other comparable districts and also regional districts. I wanted to note that Mike has never used any sick days or carried over. And we have some proposed contract changes. We want to add an additional year onto the contract to maintain a five-year contract. So that would be July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2023. We'd like to increase Mike's annual salary by 1% in line with other MPS employee groups. So he would go up to $164,236. Uh, we would like to increase his professional dues from 1,000 to 1,500. These are association dues for superintendent membership and professional organizations of school administrators or approved community organizations. We would also like to uh, propose reinstatements from the 2015 concessions. So we would like to return to you your five vacation days. Uh, so vacation from 25 days to 30 days with five vacation days that can be carried over. We would, <clears throat> so that would be a change from 30 to 35 days for carryover. And we would like to re return the concession of the National Conference stipend to uh, not to exceed over $2,000. And at this time, I would, do we do a motion for this? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I would accept a motion to approve these um, contract changes. I'll move to approve the contract changes as outlined by President Singer. Support. Moved by Scott, support by Angela, and it's open for discussion. I know Pam and I had spent time going through based on since I was the one, how long ago was that? Five years. <laughs> Five years ago. That was part of the original contract and had worked, you know, the last two years on it. So um, we really, you know, took a look at that in, right. you know, looking at this year's I feel proposal. like they Angela and Jerry line. did a nice job and we got a great bargain with <laughs> Mr. Shero. And uh, I, I feel like um, this is um, high time you, with uh, the evaluation of highly effective on all accounts is very impressive, and um, I feel like this is, is uh, um, a great thing that that we can we can do these small things to hopefully uh, keep you happy and engaged here. And we certainly certainly appreciate um, the service that that you have provided us and and your leadership. So. We really do appreciate your work ethic, Mike. I mean, you haven't missed any time. You use your own money to pay for mm -hmm. seminars and conferences. Um, your integrity uh, continues to impress me, uh, and I imagine the rest of this board as well, um, on a daily and weekly basis. And for anybody out there watching that says, holy cow, that's a lot that we're giving you, it really isn't. We're bringing you up to speed with, with your peers. Um, you have been uh, under the same concessions that the rest of the work groups have, and, and you didn't have to do that, uh, but you led by example, and, and we appreciate that. And so, uh, like Pam said, this is just a kind of a small token to, to bring you where you should be, um, and we, we appreciate everything you do. Uh, and I think, you know, a couple of them are, you know, the, the conference that you have been attending anyway, that we're reinstating that, and then the professional, what did we call it? The <laughs> Dues. Professional dues. dues. Yeah, the professional right. dues. And really, I mean, that, that helps the whole district. Yeah. When you're attending these and you're bringing back ideas, it's, you know, a benefit Need to everybody in the group. district. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and it, you know, puts you in touch with your peers when you're 
at others. So, you know, you do things not only on a Michigan level, but on a national level, and that benefits all of us. Yeah, the dues continue to increase in our professional association, so that helps cover it. Okay, if there's no other comments, then we will move into a vote. All in favor of approving the 2018 MPS superintendent contract proposed changes, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. Let the record show. We have five ayes and one nay. Okay, now we will move into item four. We have a request to address the board. I believe we have two. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Vanette. You're getting used to this, but if you could state your name and address, that would be great. That one wasn't my idea. Okay. Um, sorry, let me get that. Okay, we're good? Okay, uh, Jennifer Vanette, 603 Coolidge Drive. So last meeting I was here and I asked you to stop embracing a testing culture. I brought it up because the document that I was given stated the purpose of realigning social studies at this particular point is because of MSTEP. Uh, Mr. Bruton offered a different argument at the last meeting, but the document I was supplied with said testing. I pointed out that our community is struggling due to high pressure standardized testing, increased class sizes, higher homework burdens, less free and creative play, more pay to play extracurriculars, and teachers who feel like they're under attack and cannot rely on the school board or administration to put their expertise first. Your methods have been turning our kids into competitors and it's broken down community, despite the fact that community building is the surest way to increase safety. You may have noticed some cheering from some teenagers in the crowd. After the meeting, they approached me uh, to thank me for calling out this culture. Uh, they wanted to believe that they have a value beyond their test score and grade point average, but at this point, they feel like they see where things stand. They thanked me for telling you that they are not okay. They really hoped that it mattered that I said it. So I figured you needed to hear that message again. The high schoolers are not okay, and they're telling us that they're not okay. Students have also complained that they spend far too much time in a school year on testing. They particularly hate the required testing instruction review, partly because they already know it, given that they test all the time, and because it repeats in every class, and because it's repeated before the test begins. It wastes an entire instructional day. You create a pressure and a stress by doing this. And on the opposite end, you also have students who are now just determined to not care at all. And they completely understand it's not in their educational interests. We should be fighting against more testing, which is an enormous drain on our resources, which by the way, on a state level, the amount of money we throw away, it all goes out of our state economy. It doesn't stay here, doesn't help us. And the only thing a test proves is a student's ability to sit and take a test, which is not a life skill, and their socioeconomic status. That's it. I wonder how many of you have contacted your representative to act on HB 5707. This Michigan House bill is necessary to stop the mandate for 40% of teacher evaluations to be based on testing, set to take effect next year. It's outrageous. If it takes effect, teachers have told me they will be forced to teach to the test and eliminate innovative ideas, meaning our kids lose again, meaning the end of anything resembling critical thinking skills, meaning despite PYP language, we won't have time to put it into practice. Students are already handicapped at the college level. We are already having to remediate basic writing, critical analysis, development, research, and so much more when students reach college. And when you can't do these things, it also turns out you're not very good at higher level math either. Not acting on HB 5707 will guarantee our students are not prepared. And I'm fully aware that we have to comply with testing in order to receive funds, but it's not okay. And we shouldn't act like it's okay. Testing companies are extraordinarily remiss when it comes to diversity and inclusion, which is why it is then left out of schools while we are busily teaching to a test. Even, fostering, even though fostering cultural awareness and helping students identify implicit bias is a proven key to success later in life. Instead, we choose testing. 
a test that is not representative of our society and does nothing to prepare students to become engaged citizens. When we teach to a test, we also model for students a passive lack of engagement. I believe that you are on the board because you want vibrant public education for all students. I believe that. Our students, though, are losing that curiosity. They're not curious seekers by the end of middle school. They have been taught to go through the motions and to only care if it's on the test, and they're bored. You don't develop a Herbert H. Dow or an Alden Dow through testing. So support our teachers. We know that many factors determine test scores and individual teachers are only a small component. So I ask you to call your representative to act on HB 5707 and to let the teachers know you have their backs. Minimize the emphasis on testing in order to reduce pressure and go back to building a community of curious explorers. No one single thing is gonna fix our problems, but we risk losing excellent teachers and our students are begging for something more. We're supposed to be the city of modern explorers I think it's time we act like it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hold comments to the end of the board meeting, but uh, in, yes, please come forward. I have uh, Daniel Segura, is that yes, correct? Yes. I'm uh, Daniel Segura, 1428 Bittler Street. Thank you, and we'll set the clock for five minutes. Thank you. My name is Daniel Segura. I have three children in the MPS district. I'm a highly involved parent and a volunteer regularly in many capacities. I'm coming to you today because I have a problem that I'm hoping you can address. My problem is not experienced, one experienced by many families of most children, but those who fall outside of the typical standard deviations of learning and knowledge and the bell curve. My problem is relevant to a kid who falls outside these norms um, and it creates difficulty. Our schools are designed to move the majority of students into and through a standard curriculum of content, understanding, values, process, and frankly, conformity. So what takes, what actions we can take to measure that our students don't fit into these norms, don't fall behind. We need all of the efforts that the Middle Public School mission states that prepares our students as knowledgeable, self-reliant, cooperative, and ethical learners who are contributing citizens. Midland Public Schools have also adopted the IB PYP curriculum, which does, despite assertions otherwise, leave plenty of room for addressing individual needs of students. So I guess you're probably wondering what I'm getting at, and here's that. I have a daughter who is exceptional, who is um, gifted, and she loves learning, but it's only been through well-placed teachers that she can ever even bear to go to school. Um, this year in fourth grade and kindergarten, uh, before, she had two teachers who had extensive experience working with gifted children. They knew how to keep her engaged and stimulated. She loves school during these two years and learns so much. She's been excited about school. The other years that she's been in school, she's despised. One year she came home crying almost every day and was completely miserable. Her teacher was very rigid and penalized her for being outside the box. The teacher just kept saying she needed to focus and try harder. We ended up having to have her independently evaluated because her teacher was not able to identify that her giftedness was the reason she was struggling. I'm going to skip ahead because I don't want to run out of time. This year, we found out how to help our daughter continue to be engaged and want to go to school. We discovered that what she needed was the right teacher with the right training. Mrs. Susan Schaefer is an outstanding teacher with training and working with gifted and talented students. There's a program in that Siebert ran this year, um, an advanced math attempt. Um, it was poorly planned, poorly executed. Uh, it was hastily pulled together, and it did not provide um, adequate training for the students. Um, it really just gave them a little bit of advanced uh, math, uh, one grade ahead, which if you're a gifted student, doesn't help at all. Um, gifted students do not learn by rote learning. They learn very quickly. And so all this did was just give them a chance to have more rote learning than they already had. Um, I'm asking you in the minute and 44 that I have 
to consider looking into, um, I want, I'm going to read this part very specifically. I'd like you to introduce a motion to commence a study that studies quantity, status, service for and possibilities for gifted and talented at elementary level for students. Require building principles to analyze existing testing data along with qualitative information provided by teachers, not just testing, to best know how to support the needs of the highest performing students. Require building principles to advertise gifted and talented testing opportunities well in advance. Provide better support and earlier and more transparent planning for the advanced math attempt currently underway at Seabird. Consider recognizing teachers for bringing in positive and engaging activities for the really bright students while simultaneously meeting the needs of all students. In second grade, my daughter tested at fifth grade math level and th grade 13 reading level. Uh, she's an incredibly precocious student. She's participated in every single out extracurricular opportunity, um, all the science fairs, all the robotics teams. Um, as parents, we participate in all that as well. Uh, she doesn't want to go to school unless she's engaged in school. And the PYP curriculum creates space for that, uh, we've, even we, though we've been told it doesn't. And we believe that training for teachers, this is stuff that wouldn't cost a lot of extra money. Recognizing those teachers would all be beneficial to our students. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else that would like to come to the board and speak? Yes, please. If you'd state your name, your address, and we'll set the clock for five minutes. Good evening. My name is Kurt Yaki, and I live at 3600 Valley Drive. <clears throat> Once again, I'm here to speak with you about the, uh, the 2014 bond, where there were promises made um, about what would be done with the $121 million of the tax increase. So with the website that you know about, we've um, had close to 7,000 visits. And so the question is, why, why is the public interested in that? And I think the answer is very clear, because it's their money, and they were made promises, and now they know that it's not going to happen for their neighborhood school or the other facilities. But they want to know what are the things that were deleted and why. So since we're not able to get answers, I came up with something that perhaps would be helpful. That is, it's a simple chart, and I'll go through it. It says administration and board 2014 disclosure form, and all we need is the information filled in, and that way we could put this up right next to the boards that are already on the walls here in the administration building that had all the promises, what we will do. So it's really simple. We just need someone to say for each school, what items were deleted, the reasons for the deletion, what savings resulted from the deletion, were there any items that were reinstated, because there have been a few, and to what projects were the savings diverted? Is there any reason why the public should not get this information? Is there any reason at all? Seems to me this could be done by the time of the next board meeting. And that way, everyone could easily see what was deleted from what they were promised. And the answers would be just clear. But we aren't provided with that information, although there have been many requests. Even a member of the board has requested this information. It still hasn't been, <clears throat> still has not been provided. So how can it be unreasonable to ask a public entity to make clear what happened to the public money? 
What might cause the board or the administration to reject this request? Um, I can't think of one, but uh, one thing that will probably be said later today will be that all that information is already on the website. Well, a hundred and some pages on the website makes it really hard to figure out. But if this was filled out, it would not be difficult. And real transparency would occur. I would suggest that if there is any cost to the district that the district can't um, bear, I'd be happy to pay for the clerical time that it would take to fill this in. So if the district um, just can't find a way to pay for this information to be accumulated in one place, I'm very happy to pay for it. On another topic, um, just a minute ago, Mr. Sharo was granted a raise, and I wonder, um, might you really consider that he was always give, already given a raise by the fact that the district hired his wife? Now the district has to construct an alternate path for evaluation of the early learning program, right? Has to happen because it can't go through the superintendent's office because there would be an obvious conflict. If you don't understand that, you don't know what a conflict is. It's a question of governance. A board is there for governance purposes. And if this board is not willing to take on these governance questions, what are you here for? This self-inflicted governance problem of conflict of interest could have been avoided, but instead it was created. What is that path for any issue with the early learning program? Where does it go now? It doesn't go through the superintendent. And how will the public know? Those, I think, are important questions for you to consider. I'm going to leave these with you so that hopefully they'll be completed so the public can see them. Okay, thank you for your comments. Are there anyone, is there anyone else who would like to address the board tonight? All right. We will move on to item five, which is curriculum instruction and assessment. We have item 5.1. I believe we have meeting minutes. And Ms. Friedel was the chair. Um, we had our meeting on Monday, May 21st. Uh, members present, myself, uh, Brad Blasey, Patrick Fazee, Mike Sharrow, Brian Bruton, and we also had guests Scott Cochran, Kevin Dodick, and Bill Brown. And we met at the Buildings Trades House, which is on Gary Street. And the start time was earlier to uh, be able to accommodate the students that were also there, some award-winning stu students. Um, uh, the house tour, Kevin Dodick, B Building Trades teacher, Bill Brown, City of Midland Building Department, Department liaison, Scott Cochran, who is the Auxiliary Education Curriculum Specialist, um, discussed the overall building trades project and partnership for the 2017-18 school year. The year's partnership in included the City of Midland and the ARC. The 1,500 square feet um, ranch is fully compliant with the American with Disability Act requirements. Um, being fully handicap accessible and includes zero-step construction. In the final weeks of the school year, students will be putting the final touches on the interior and the exterior of the home and property. It's a beautiful house. I could, I could live there myself. Mm. It, um, it's uh, really nice. And uh, the uh, person who is purchasing the home um, helped in the design and, and colors and picked out what he wanted um, within his reason to, to be able to pay, but it's a, a very nice facility. And the kids that were there were so proud of um, what they accomplished and, and pointing out the details. It was uh, really nice. Oh, very good. 
thank you for that. Oh, we won't be meeting again until September. Okay. Well, that's a good meeting to end on. I always love looking at the building trades uh, and product for sure. So happy days ahead. So we have item 5.2 for information. We have the 2018-19 district school improvement plan. Yep, and before you this evening, uh, we bring to you the district and school improvement plans for information only. Um, this really is the culmination of months of work that started back in February, and there were countless hours dedicated by staff members, administrators, and even community and board members as well, too, in this process. We host three sessions uh, with district employees to be able to put these plans together, and we also have members of the community and the board review them through our DSIC process as well, too. So those plans are now before you for information. If anyone would like to view those plans, we have those in the curriculum office, and they'll be brought to you again at the next board meeting for approval so we can upload those in compliance with state statute to also be able to submit our federal and state applications that align to those plans as well. Brian, can you kind of give us a little background on um, how school improvement plans are integrated with district in improvement plans? Sure, no problem. Um, the, the district improvement plan really focuses on supporting the initiatives that are within the school improvement plans. And our budget dollars allocated to these plans from a district level and also the grants that we apply for at the federal and state level are all aligned to the expenditures and strategies that are integrated within these plans. This really is the last year that the plans will be utilizing the current platform that they're on. The state is going through a substantial change in the platform that they're using. The rumor is that we're shifting to a new platform called ePROVE, and this will really change the way that the district plan is written from goal subject areas to more of a systemic approach. We're also looking for a change in the way that the state requires us to do what we call a comprehensive needs assessment, which really is a compilation of data that focuses on not only assessment data, but also behavioral data, also social emotional needs, behavioral needs, really looking at the whole child approach as well. So next year, the process that we've typically been going through will likely be modified, and you'll look at substantial rewrites at our school and also our district level, and we're gonna rely heavily on some professional development and also uh, regional support as well too, to help guide us through what those changes are gonna be next year. Will there continue to be community involvement in those? There will be. That is still a mandated part of the process. We still will have DSIC heavily involved in that, and the buildings will have involvement as well, too. What it specifically is going to look like in terms of timelines is really going to be um, specified to us when we learn what the rollout is next fall. Okay, great. Great. I know Mary was uh, yeah, engaged I, I in this. I got to serve on the committee this year, and it, it was interesting because I was, um, as a teacher, was on the other side of the fence and now was reviewing what um, the different schools had, had proposed and, and written up. Um, very interesting process, and it's really nice to see, um, of course it's mandated, but the, the diversity of the group of people that were there to, um, to work on this. Thank you. And thank you, Brian. Yep. We'll move into item six, which is finance facilities and operations. We have 6.1, which is a study committee meeting minutes. And who? I have them, Pam. Okay. Oh, yeah, I was going to say I don't have them. So. We met on June 4th, and members present were myself, Ms. Branstadt, who sub for Patrick Fazee, Pam Singer, Mike Sherrill, Mr. Cooper, and Lori Holderby. And our guest presents were Daryl Dombrow from Barton Mallow and Daryl Dale Jerome from French Associates. First, we discussed the bond. The following three project slash purchases were presented and discussed and will be brought to the full board for approval on June 11th. The storage area network, uh, cafeteria furniture purchase at Siebert and Chestnut Hill. And the third one, um, <coughs> we will discuss Later, the, the stadium soil stabilization um, due to the, the prevailing wage law issues. Finance, facilities, and operations. Mr. Cooper, Ms. Holderby, and Mr. Sherrill reviewed and discussed the following items with the committee. The April financial reports, the upcoming summer tax resolution and millage rates for 2018-19, the 2018-19 employee salary letter, 
the 2018-19 proposed budget, and the superintendent's contract and compensation. So as you can see, we had a very full, busy meeting, and our next meeting will be Monday, July 10th at 5 p.m. Great. Uh, Patrick Frizzy sent me an email, and, and I'm going to read that real quick because he couldn't be here, and he chairs the FFO committee. He said, hello, Pam. I wanted to let you know that I will not be able to attend the MPS board meeting on Monday night. My presence is required at the City of Midland City Council meeting that takes place at the same time and date. Um, as a wastewater department superintendent for the City of Midland, I am involved in a presentation to City Council regarding the flooding event that took place June of 2017. This presentation is a culmination of work that was done over the past nine months with a committee of select city employees. My attendance at the City Council meeting tonight is mandatory and is an important part of my duties with the City of Midland. I realize that I will be absent from the board meeting where the budget will be tentatively approved. As treasurer, I have been a part of the budget process that is up for approval. I don't want my absence to indicate any concern that I may have with the budget. I have full faith that this budget has been prepared and thoroughly inspected, reviewed by Mike and his staff. I am confident that the passage of this budget is in the best interest of MPS. Patrick. I thought the community might want to know why uh, Patrick couldn't be here tonight. All right, um, we will move on to item seven, which is human resources. Whoop. Gifts. Okay. Yes. Gifts. Oops. The, Whoop. The gifts. Item six. Six, two. six point six. two for information. Gifts. Bob? Yeah, it, uh, it continues to go well here. 18 different gifts for $19,806.94. It does run the gamut here, and again, not able to read all of these, but you'll see from individual donors or groups that, that gave to some of the usual groups like JPAC at Jefferson or where our own uh, teams and students get involved in the Community Gives program through Dow Chemical, where they have to donate their time to get that money, and of course from Boosters Clubs at those. Mm -hmm. And so again, 18 different items for just under 20000 there is an item under 6.3 that does require your action just because of the size of the gift requires your approval. It's $5,000. It's to the Middle High Robotics team uh, from the Gerstacker Foundation. Very good. I'd love to accept a motion for item 6.3. So moved. That's Support. awesome. Moved by Mary. Support by Angela. All in favor of accepting this gift totaling $5,000 from the Gerstacker Foundation, please say aye. 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 All opposed? And, of course, it passes. Thank you so much, Gerstackers. Mm -hmm. And we will move into item 7, which is human resources, item 7.1. Um, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Miss Dorothy Jane Linden, who taught kindergarten for 22 years at several MPS elementary schools, retiring in 1983. Mrs. Linden was a recipient of the Gerstacker Excellence in Teaching Award in 1976. So, great. Obviously, Thank a you. great teacher. Absolutely. We have item eight point. Uh, we have correspondence to and from the board. Eight point one. We have several letters of information that will be sent from the Board of Education, and we have item eight point two, which was a FOIA request by Mr. Kurt Yaki for hourly rates of pay for those who provided previous FOIA dates requested. For item nine, we have scheduled activities for information. Um, you have a list of scheduled meetings for uh, the rest of the year and. Now we move into item 10, which is study discussion session. So I'd love to open this up with Angela. All right. Um, first, thanks to everyone for all of the work on the budget. Um, I've been on the board long enough that I was here when we didn't have such rosy budgets. So I really appreciate all the hard work that everyone has done. Um, congrats to the Shining Stars tonight. Um, both my kids had the privilege of having Mark Jungle for a teacher when they were in eighth grade. So I um, concur with that parent's comments about Mark. Um, good luck on finals to all the students. I must say I 
kind of forgot school was still in session because it's not at my house. <laughs> um, so good luck on finals to everybody. Um, also exciting, tomorrow Midland High School has two sports teams that um, will be playing. The girls soccer, which you know my daughter grew up playing with a lot of those seniors on the team. Good luck to them. And then the baseball team also um, phenomenal. So if people are interested um, in going baseball, it's just going to be right at CMU, so very close. Um, if people want to go out and see those tomorrow. Um, and then finally, congratulations to the class of 2018, um, our first time having graduation at Dow Diamond. Um, I got only positive comments. I don't know if people reserve negative for other people, but it was a, it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful venue. And I, I think just the ability for people to have assigned seats where they didn't have to be there two hours early and to have the backs on the seats and to be able to purchase water and sit there and just, just it was a wonderful, wonderful um, venue and a wonderful experience. And congratulations to, I think it's probably around 650 total students probably that graduated from Midland Public Schools. And good luck to all of them as they um, go forth in their future. All right, and that is all I have. Thank you, Angela. Brad? On to you, Brad. I um, just want to congratulate again the Shining Stars, Gala and Mr. Jungle. Uh, obviously, the great presentation, fifth grade IB PYP exhibition and role of mentors. Dr. Linda Lipsid, uh, uh, Mr. Penix, uh, Greg Smith for his volunteering, uh, Aaron for hers as well. I only got Calvin's name down. I apologize. I didn't get the other three names down, but great <laughs> job, young ones, and thanks for sharing your experience. Um, sounds like an awesome program. Uh, I hope it continues and that many more people volunteer. Um, want to thank... Uh, Dr. Jennifer Varnat for her comments, also, also to Daniel Segura, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Yaki, and the building trades, yes. I did go to building trades with Mary. Obviously, that's kind of up my alley a little bit, so I really enjoyed seeing that. And um, the young kids were very interested in what they were doing. They went into a lot of detail, and I was able to ask them some tough questions, and they were able to respond, which was great. Um, also, comment about the DSIC, that's great that we could have a, an upgrade to that, but I, I served on that last year, and it was very good, and, and thanks for doing that. Um, and finally, Bob and Lori, great job. Thank you for all the information. Thanks for the clear presentation, and I know it takes a lot. All right. Um, great meeting tonight. I really enjoyed the exhibition uh, presentation. Um, it was encouraging to see the level of involvement that the mentors actually uh, played while still leaving control of the total project with the students to let them kind of steer the way. Um, just a, a wonderful program, and those kids are so, so talented to, to come up here and, and, and be as articulate as they are and, and to present in the manner that they did. I was, I was really impressed. Um, Mr. Scor, I, I really appreciate um, what you had to say tonight. Um, I have a son who's very talented as well, who's in the second grade, who I often find helping his older brother, who's a fourth grader. Um, so although I'm not going to make a motion like you requested, I am going to ask that we explore this a little bit further. I suspect there are things in place to foster and identify gifted and talented children, um, but I would like to know more about what we're doing to support those teachers. Um, in, in doing so. Uh, so whether there is or there isn't, we're going to find out. Um, and, and I would like to let you know that um, that did pique my interest um, right away. So I, I would like to explore that a little bit further for you and, and hopefully um, at some point down the road uh, get back to you with where we stand and, and maybe what we can do to support these kids because if they're out there struggling um, and we don't know how to identify them, that, that is an issue to me. Um, and I think that's probably an issue to everybody. So uh, we'll look at that a little bit further. So thank you for your comments tonight. Um, it, I guess that's really the uh, the important thing that I wanted to mention tonight. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Mary. Um, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say congratulations to those teachers who achieved uh, tenure this year. Yes. Um, there was quite a list and um, that they 
have continued growth in their teaching career. I remember when I achieved that 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 stepping stone, and it felt so good, but it doesn't make you want to stop. You want to just keep um, improving on what you're doing and, and uh, making learning the best you possibly can for your students. So congratulations. My grandson's kindergarten teacher was one of those teachers. So Aww. she's awesome. <laughs> Most people have said everything that I would say. Just con lots of congratulations to his retiring teachers and staff and, and uh, to Gayla and Mark and Linda and Jeff for being uh, great leaders at your school and supportive of the PYP program because the exhibition is absolutely amazing. So uh, I'd always encourage anybody to get a chance to go next year when you get a chance. And the students, as everyone has said, they just amaze me for being 10-year-old kiddos and and the skills that they will take forward with them. I'm sure we'll see their names down the road and, and something um, important. We're sitting here, sitting here I I'm, love to take the school newspapers home from the high school. And um, sometimes uh, a lot of people don't realize that these are out and about, but they're award winners. And if you really want to know what's happening at the two high schools, they're well worth uh, reading. And I believe they're um, online as well, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And Bob, Lori, and all involved with the budget, you always make it easier for some of us to understand. And I know we spent a lot of time at our FFO meeting. We were discussing the budget and the bond as well. And uh, with Dale and um, Daryl there to guide us through the, the, um, all the bond issues and going through all the, the steps of what we purchase and why we're doing the things. I, I believe um, they are very transparent to me and... I think if, if people would really look into that or call us if you have any questions and we can answer those um, questions that you may have because they're doing great work on a daily basis um, with your bond money. And today as I read through the communique this time of year, um, we see a few more um, comments about students that are doing amazing things. So even though our students, many of them are feel like they're overwhelmed. You also see the students that, yes, they may be overwhelmed, but they're enjoying what they do. And their accomplishments are just amaze me. The awards that they win and the young man, and his name um, eludes me right now, from Dow High that just won the award for being prepared to go to college. I watched his video, so <laughs> clever, but so heartwarming. Hardworking young man, excited and very prepared to go off to college. So um, we do prepare our students well, and um, the feedback we get from kids that go off to college or technical schools or into the workforce, the vast majority of them are very pleased with their uh, middle and public schools education. Mm -hmm. I know personally I have five children that are uh, successful, happy to our teachers, and they felt that middle and public schools served them very well over their years. And lastly, enjoy summer. Next time we meet, it'll be summer vacation. I Thank think you. it's well-deserved for everyone. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. I was super excited with the uh, baseball and the soccer this, this uh, week. Um, I would love to go tomorrow to see that baseball game. I just don't think it'll fit in the schedule. <laughs> but um, what, what great accomplishments for those two teams, and the coaches have to be walking on clouds right now. Uh, one thing I wanted to share is this past six months, I've been involved in a positive psychology class here in Midland. And it's a class that was uh, brought here by the University of Pennsylvania. And we had uh, 39 different community leaders that were a part of this class. And our commitment was over 146 hours of really focusing on how we can bring positive psychology to Midland, how we can uh, move the well-being to, um, to a, a higher level in this community, and I couldn't have been more pleased. I didn't know when I signed up that there would be three Midland Public Schools teachers um, or administrators involved. Kathy Schneider from Dow High, Julie Villano from Dow High, and Teela Sherman from um, Jefferson were all involved. There was, uh, the mayor was there, as well as most many executive directors from nonprofits in the community. And it was, um, a really uh, exciting event. I thought I knew a lot about psychology already and kind of wondered why I 
you know, was, was requested to come to this. And I do a lot of work with developmental assets, but what I found is there's a lot of, um, a lot more research around psychology that can support what we're trying to do with developmental assets and kids. And we know that the more assets that kids have, the better they do. And I look at programs like the PYP program in all of our elementary schools, and it gives me such pride because it's what we need to really surround these kids to build them up to, to have the, that well-being that we're talking about. And um, these administrators and teachers that are involved, part of the project is we have to give back to our community for a year. And we all had to have a project and a paper due at the end of this class. So this was no small feat. So to listen to all the projects now that are going to happen in Midland because of people's engagement in this class is, is mind-blowing. And um, I was fortunate enough to hear the administrators and the teachers talk about their projects. And, and um, I sat in on one of the uh, admin meetings when they were presenting that to the administration team. And I surely appreciated that as well. But um, they really want to start with ad administration first and then teachers and then students. But they have a plan in place, and I would love to hear more about that, um, too, in the future for one of our board meetings. Um, as I listened tonight uh, to Mr. Yaki, I couldn't help but think what my teacher would have said from this po positive psychology class. I, I don't believe he would have supported the you should publicize and, and, and write out and focus on all the things you didn't do. I mean, who, who builds a house? I wonder if, if uh, our high school students built that house and stood back and said, wow, mom and dad, look at this. Look at everything I didn't accomplish. Look what I didn't do. I don't build a house like that. I don't, I don't believe our schools should build a, a a school system like that. I believe that we have to focus on what is most important and we have to invest in it. And I believe that we're going to have to make decisions and those decisions are tough. And that's why we're here. And that's why the administrative team is here. And that's why we've hired a great superintendent. And to have someone come in here and point at us and say, no, you need to highlight all this. I don't agree. And I don't think it's right and I don't support it. So I believe that we've been transparent and we have information on the website. Mike is available constantly, says it over and over. We've had open houses. He has been at the open houses. The administration team has been at the open houses. If people have a question, please come to us and ask. There's another part that with positive psychology, we talk about relationships. And when you want to get something done, the relationship is the A number one most important piece. And if a community member wants to sue and is always looking for ways to, to bash or humiliate, that is not a relationship building relationship. And it's not going to go far. As a board, we work well if we have good relationship with each other and we have good relationship with the administration team and with our superintendent. And if we don't, we will not work well together. And I think that is so important. I think focusing on well-being, not only for our schools and our community, is important for our board as well. And maybe that's something that we want to uh, really take a look at moving forward is how can we pull together and, and learn from this great research on psychology and make our start here at our home and make this strong and then move out to our teachers and our administrators? Because if we can't get it right here, then how can we expect anyone else to get it right out there? So it has to start here. Um, Tonight, we talked about testing and measures, and <clears throat> I get that. I, um, 
I know it's hard to take tests, and I know there's anxieties out there, and I know kids struggle. Um, I also... I also measure all the time. I mean, it's a part of my job. It's what I do at the Legacy Center. I go into many nonprofits and I help them measure if they're really making a change in kids' lives and people's lives. And, and if, if folks can prove they're making a change, then they get financing, right? And then more change happens. And in the schools, it's, it's the same kind of thing. We have to find a way to know that what we're doing is working because shame on us if we don't know what we're doing is working. And can we improve? Can we change things? I, I believe we can, and we can lessen the, the negative impacts on testing. But um, I also believe we've made huge mo leaps forward with testing. I mean, we are doing a lot less testing in the schools now than we've done 10 years ago. And, and we, can, we can continue we can continue to learn and move forward and see where we can go. It's definitely something um, to look further into. Gifted and talented, uh, Mike and I, have, and I have talked about this for probably going on, on a little over a year. Um, we've talked about different opportunities and programs, and, um, and, and we continue to look at that. So it's, it's something we're interested in, and and we'll, and we'll dig deeper into that. So um, all in all, tonight was a great meeting. I'm super uh, excited about the budget and, and where we're headed, headed with that and appreciate all the hard work that went in to that. And, and Mike, I'm glad we ratified this contract. You're thank very you. well deserving and we're very fortunate to have you as a leader, so thank you. We'll start there. Thank you for letting me serve for five years, and I look forward to serving for five more years. It's a wonderful community that we are in. Um, on the Gifted Talent Program, a um, few of the CIA main members may recall, we have actually, you'll be glad to hear, did a full study of, of GT. GT is kind of a forbidden word today in education, and I still, am, maybe I'm a little bit gray-haired guy who still believes in it, so I've had a lot of discussion about GT since I've been here. And what we do is called cross-grading, and we would like to do something vastly different than that. So you and I are probably, and our team is on actually on the same wavelength on that. And um, at some point, we got this fully ready to go for the fall. I don't know what we do right now. We'll be glad to sit down and discuss that with you where we're heading. And so there's a... Um, so GTE at the elementary uh, was originally created probably 30, 40 years ago where they actually did a little bit of separation in the school day. And so inclusion is, it, is not the where you would want to go. So we have tried to do that um, before school as you were talking, but it, we have a whole um, another level of that we'd like to go on that. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, even Odyssey in the Mind and some competitions eventually for those kids to expand their skill sets going forward. And so um, it, th that's been a study for the entire school year. We presented a little bit to the CIA committee, um, more work to go on that piece of it. The other one I would, um, I just happened to jot this down, Mrs. Vanetti, knowing that you sent the topic ahead of time and being a good superintendent, I looked ahead. Um, so I, as you said, Pam, one of the things that um, we do lobby the state, and I know your question, ironically, is, is do they contact legislators? I know three of you have on that exact topic because I encourage them to do as well. And... Um, Good, good data that Brian actually provided to me, so I'll give him kudos, is um, the Michigan Merit Exam in 2015 uh, was 16 hours long. Yeah. You guys remember that? Well, yeah, I was going to say, we have changed. We've gone yeah. from fall testing where they have to cram when they first start back to school yeah. to spring testing. And, then, we've, yeah, lo there was and we've lobbied huge, really hard. M steps yeah. down to three and a half. Yeah. But our state superintendent who recently passed away um, has been our one of our best advocates, and he has put in, um, I would call it a pilot, correct me wrong on that, Brian, it's really Brian's area, um, where he is going to do a, pre, a short pre-assessment. Uh, we have the option the first year. A short pre-assessment beginning of the year, you could take the option of doing a very small, brief checkpoint assessment, like in January, December, and then a final assessment at the end to measure that growth you're talking about to drive instruction. So he, that, that's something many districts will take advantage of. He was not able to move the legislators completely out of the testing realm, which is what his hope to, is to do once he get, got, gets his data rolling going forward. So state testing, there's in, increases. But I think also your point probably was 
um, internal testing as well. And, and Mary, you were in high schools and high achieving district, high achieving community, IBAP testing, um, the, the will to do well. We do see stress on our kids that are that are highly motivated. I'm not sure how much of it's actually are are put on, or how much of it's parent or they're themselves motivated. Kids on themselves. Yes. Too. yes. Yeah. We got a little work to do there as well. So just a brief one on that one off your comments there. Uh, prevailing wage was a topic tonight, and so. Wednesday or Thursday, right? I don't recall now. Uh, last Wednesday. week, the legislators have moved that legislation, um, so we are no longer prevailing wage required. Um, and uh, often as they do, sometimes they um, move, when they move quickly, they don't always think of everything that has occurred. So it, it takes place immediately. And so all of us who had already bid contracts but not had accepted those contracts to see that we're kind of caught in a gray area. And even our legal consultants are saying, uh, we could argue either way for you. Not comfortably arguing either way for you, but it's, it's a gray area that very some of you are caught in, and we were. And so we checked on the uh, um, electronic storage uh, unit, and since that was 95% uh, product and 5% professional services, which is there's categories under prevailing wage professional services, not one that's required. We were okay to bring that one tonight, but we had the soil stabilization project ready had been bid. We came back, we were bringing that result to you, um, but that is a prevailing wage job. If you, I sent you the second legal opinion. I want you to go back and look at the Clark Hill one, not the Truen one, and item number three on that one specifically. Um, it appears that they are suggesting that you could work with your, your bidders, in our case, three bidders, and go back and say, does that change your bid on prevailing wage? Um, where does it go from there? Our low bidder is so low that I don't think it's going to change it all, but we pulled it, make sure we do our due diligence. We hope to bring it June 25 because if we don't, the soil stabilization will not make the summer schedule, and it will be one full year ahead, which could cause us even more problems in there. That soil stabilization was going to stabilize the stadium five to seven years out, and at some point that cement in the stands would have to be replaced. So a um, little bit of a quick movement on that one, but we're working on that one due to the prevailing wage going forward. Um, more here. Positive psychology, Pam. You almost took my whole speech here. <laughs> uh, um, but I'll add to that. So we are working on positive psychology. The plan is to bring it through our administrative team down to our teachers all the way to our students. But we are also working on a piece with um, um, losing my spot here. Um, our community listens, which actually fits into this as well. And it's the movement within the uh, our Midland community, or actually the Great Lakes Bay Area as well, with a gentleman named Bob Chapman, CEO of Barry White Waymiller Design Group, who, which created an institute for this. And it fits very well within this positive psychology piece as well. And so we are trying to bring that forward because not only um, do we think it will advance us as an administrative team and how we function together, um, a teaching team and a student team, but we believe that um, some of the issues we're seeing in our society today um, from the violence issues are, are a part of how we are thinking as a society and so positive psychology. We're very excited about the potential of that going forward. Um, I thought I had one more and I don't think so. So we're the, the, very brief what I had tonight because we met two weeks ago and so then not a lot, a whole lot on there and we'll be back again in two weeks to prove that final budget. So thank you. Very good. At this point, I will uh, encourage a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Support. Moved by Mary, support by Scott. Oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned. <laughs>